did New Zealand's wealthiest school become the centre of one of the country's biggest sexual abuse cases? At the boys' only boarding school, Dilworth, hundreds of students suffered serious abuse over three decades. What's more, they say the school went out of its way to cover it up. Dilworth, a school that had a sparkling reputation and a noble goal to take in disadvantaged children and give them education, faith and opportunity. The school that promised these boys so much instead took everything from them. Nestled in the heart of Auckland's Remuera is a century-old boarding school. Its founders were James and Isabella Dilworth, a childless couple who left behind their property fortune and a lofty vision. Documents show that in 1978, Dilworth knew at least five other students were being abused by Peter Taylor. That number later grew to 10. The school claims it carried out an internal investigation into the offending, but says the report was inexplicably destroyed years later. The police were never called. Instead, minutes from a Dilworth board meeting show Peter Taylor was allowed to quietly resign. Peter Taylor died in 2012, aged 74. If he was alive, police say he'd likely join the list of 12 men already charged with sexual assault at Dilworth. Police launched Operation Beverly in 2019. They've already identified 139 victims at Dilworth, and investigators believe another 96 children were likely abused. Welcome to another episode of We Were Children, a Dilworth School Survivors Vlog. Today we will be discussing how Dilworth's actions denied survivors the opportunity to obtain justice, that is, having their sexual abuser charged with the sexual abuse of his victims. My guest today is the former president of the Dilworth Old Boys Association and one of the current supporters and advocates for the Dilworth victims of abuse, Steve Brown. Steve has had a long relationship with Dilworth across multiple areas in multiple roles, as you will see. Steve Brown started at Dilworth in June 1969 and left in December 1975. Steve returned to Dilworth to give something back as a relief housemaster in 1998. Steve became the weekend relief stay back housemaster in 2000. He stayed until he was made redundant in January 2010. He also did some relief teaching at the junior campus during this time. Steve was elected to the Dilworth Old Boys Association Council in 2018. He became the association's first welfare officer in 2019. Steve formed part of the organising committee of the association's 100th anniversary in 2019. Steve was elected president of the Dilworth Old Boys Association in 2020 and again in 2021. Steve has been a supporter and advocate for the victims of abuse since 2018. In keeping with this, he has attended the Operation Beverly Court hearings, the Dilworth-related Royal Commission hearings, and has also assisted Dilworth Old Boys at the Dilworth Independent Inquiry. As a consequence of Steve's work and roles, he has built up an extensive knowledge of Dilworth which has made him a valuable resource for some of Dilworth's abuse survivors. Welcome, Steve. Steve, why do you believe that some of Dilworth's sexual abuse survivors were denied justice? Thanks, Greg. It is my assertion that when Dilworth applied to the courts for orders for permanent suppression of identity, that is, name suppression for its former staff members accused of sexual abuse, as well as the school's name, that this action denied many old boy victims of abuse the opportunity to see justice. Let me explain this assertion using the case of former tutor Keith Dixon. In 2013, Dilworth stated that any publication of the details of this case will not result in any other Dilworth old boys coming forward. This statement simply wasn't correct. Once Operation Beverly commenced, more and more old boys came forward. To date, somewhere in the vicinity of 200. 
This is a direct consequence of the defendants and Dilworth relinquishing or losing name suppression. I believe that Dilworth had no evidence to support their assertion that no other old boys would come forward. Therefore, I believe that the intention of this statement was to deceive, to mislead, to hide the possibility that there were more victims. This is evident by the number of old boys who came forward once the Operation Beverly defendants and Dilworth's name hit the headlines. So because of those suppression identity orders, all of Dixon's other victims were denied the opportunity to come forward in 2013 or 2014, as they didn't know Dixon was being charged with sexual offending against former students at Dilworth in the 1970s. And because Dixon died before he answered the 2020 charges, his victims were permanently denied the opportunity to see justice delivered. Having said that, had Dilworth's name been made public in 2013 or 14, one wonders how many other old boys might have come forward then about the sexual abuse they suffered from other staff and boys. How many were therefore denied justice as a consequence of not having Dilworth's name reported in the media then? When former chaplain Peter Taylor was charged in 1994, interim and final name suppression orders ensured that other victims were denied the opportunity to come forward and lay complaints. When the opportunity arose again with Operation Beverly, it was too late for Taylor's victims, as he had already died. His victims were therefore permanently denied justice. And let us not forget the 1997 case of Ian Wilson, who had name suppression granted with suppression orders keeping both his and Dilworth's identity secret. It would be another 24 years before some of his victims saw justice, a direct consequence of Operation Beverly. And still, there are more of his victims coming forward. In my opinion, this is an ex another example of Dilworth contributing towards justice delayed. Former Dilworth principal Donald McLean wrote a memorandum for the court on the 15th of November 2013. I submit that this kind of publicity will be dis a discouraging factor for needy future parents and families to send their boys to Dilworth. I request that any publication of the details of this case will not result in any other Dilworth old boys coming forward. Former Principal Donald McLean wrote an affidavit for the court on the 29th of April 2014. I am swearing this affidavit as the representative of the Dilworth Trust Board and the school. Dilworth is seeking for a permanent non-publication order preventing its name and any identifying particulars from being published. I consider that the publication of the name of Dilworth or any identifying particulars would cause undue hardship to Dilworth and the current and past pupils and the families of those pupils. I also consider that such publication will cause considerable damage to the reputation of the school. Publication of the offending may discourage future parents and families from applying for enrolment at Dilworth. I am also concerned that the reputation of Dilworth will be detrimentally impacted upon by publication. McLean also stated in 2013, we are able to provide the investigating officers with a full list of former students who would have been in the onboarding environment with Dixon. This was a completely separate building from the rest of the campus. His involvement in extracurricular activities would have been with the same group. This list, contains the details of names, known addresses and emails, as well as ages, which means all could be traced if necessary. Therefore, the ability to contact past students is high. I am very concerned that a case which goes back such a long time should impact negatively on Dilworth in 2013. It appears that Dixon was employed sometime in 1973. He left at the end of the year. These three paragraphs submitted to the court have a number of inaccuracies. First, Dixon's involvement with the Dilworth boys was not limited to those in McMurray House, as he would have been involved with dining room duties. He could also have been involved with a sports team, which would likely have had boys from other levels and houses in. For example, McMurray House tutor Greg Wycliffe 
was involved in Harriers, which included students who weren't in McMurray. Second, given the large amount of boys from the late 60s to the early 80s, known as the lost generation, who have nothing to do with Dilworth, means the chance of contacting former students from this time wasn't high at all. And finally, McLean's statement implies that Dixon's involvement with Dilworth ended in 1973. This simply is not true, as he was one of those who went on the 1974 trip to the Commonwealth Games in Christchurch. And it was on that trip that Dixon isolated some boys and sexually abused them. From the 1974 Dilworthian, Rex McIntosh wrote, I would like to thank Mr. Dixon for the help in providing cars, thereby making the trip possible. I hope all students who attended enjoyed the experience. It will be something to remember. McLean also stated in 2014 that the last thing the school needs is to relive in 2014 events of 41 years ago. This statement, in my opinion, demonstrates to with priorities, i.e. its name and reputation, as well as its lack of empathy for the victims of sexual abuse. Remember, McLean stated, I'm swearing this affidavit as the representative of the Dilworth Trust Board and school. McLean's statements appear to reflect former Dilworth Trust Board trustee and chairman Derek Firth's statement at the Royal Commission that you don't want to end up on the front page of the newspaper. One of our trustees uh, during part of this period was a director of the owner of the Herald and he often used to say to us, Whatever we do or don't do, we've got to assume it might end up on the front page of the Herald. He was a flipping director of the publication, and we were constantly vigilant to avoid that sort of thing. Steve, what are your thoughts on the investigation Dilworth carried out when they caught Chaplain Peter Taylor? Well, Dilworth has described it as a full investigation was carried out by the school, the school doctor was involved. Surely if this was a thorough investigation, why weren't the police or sexual abuse experts or counsellors involved? If this was a thorough investigation focused on the boys, aimed at getting at the bottom of how this abuse occurred and how it was missed for so long, then surely one would have expected that the investigators would have also learned about the other staff who had been sexually abusing the boys in the 1970s. How is it that this full investigation did not uncover the nefarious activities of staff such as Rex McIntosh, Graham Lindsay, Keith Dixon, Ian Wilson, Richard Galloway, Jonathan Stevens, and others? Could it be possible that those who carried out this full investigation weren't competent to do this investigation? Steve. Dr Murray Wilton made a couple of pertinent statements about this at the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse. Mistakes were made. As I say in my full submission to the Commission, my deep regret is that the instances reported to me as outlined, outlined above were not fully and properly investigated to uncover other instances of abuse at the time. Perhaps the de description, a full investigation, written by a member of Dilworth Senior Management in March 2000, is an, is an example of alternative facts. How is it that, just over a year later, when Dilworth Management learns about Rex McIntosh's inappropriate activities, that again, there was no thorough investigation carried out? Sadly, McIntosh's victims was also miss out on seeing justice, as he died in 2021 before he faced his accusers in court. Before we move on, I'd like to mention a further injustice imposed on Peter Taylor's victims, which was that he provided Dilworth a list of names of the victims on the understanding the school would follow up with counselling for them. Why then do his victims say this never happened? Steve, how would you sum up this episode? McLean's statements as a representative of the Dilworth Trust Board and the school illustrate what Dilworth's priorities were, keeping its name out of the paper, thus protecting its image and reputation. 
those statements and deal with repeated requests for orders for permanent suppression of identity. Also de demonstrate Dilworth's total lack of empathy for the victims of sexual abuse, their needs and their rights to justice. And therefore, those opportunities to get justice were repeatedly denied. Thank you, Steve, for sharing your views today on this We Were Children channel. Gratefully appreciated.